Consider a ball is thrown vertically upwards in a vacuum, which means that we can assume there's no air resistance. Describe the changes in the ball, its kinetic energy, potential energy, and its mechanical energy. So we have a ball. Let's say this is thrown upwards at an initial velocity of u. As it is going upwards, it's important to keep in mind that it's acted upon by a weight force going down. So the weight force causes a ball to experience acceleration, which is g, in the opposite direction to its initial velocity. So as the ball is going up, we expect that its velocity decreases on the way up. And this is due to the action of the weight force or gravity. So since the velocity decreases, the ball's kinetic energy, which is given by half times by its mass and speed squared, should also decrease on the way up. And of course, as the ball is traveling upwards, its height above the ground is increasing, which means that its gravitational potential energy, which is given by u m g h, is also increasing. So as the ball is traveling upwards, its kinetic energy is decreasing, which is transformed into its gravitational potential energy, causing it to increase. What about its mechanical energy? Mechanical energy of an object refers to the sum of its kinetic energy and potential energy. In this case, it's gravitational potential energy. In the absence of any air resistance or friction, the mechanical energy is always conserved, which means when you calculate the mechanical energy, that is Ke plus its gravitational potential energy, this should remain constant at all times, whether the ball is heading upwards or moving downwards. After the ball has reached its maximum height above the ground, it will start its descent going downwards. And since the velocity is in the same direction as its weight force as well as acceleration, the speed will increase over time. So as the ball is heading downward, its speed increases. And as a result, its kinetic energy also increases. As the ball is moving down, its height above the ground decreases, which means that its gravitational potential energy also decreases. In this instance, the ball's gravitational potential energy is transformed back into its kinetic energy. And like before, its mechanical energy, which is the sum of its kinetic energy and gravitational potential energy, this remains constant in the absence of any friction or air resistance. What speed is required to throw the ball vertically upwards in order to reach a maximum height of 50 meters? In this case, we need to consider the changes in the ball's kinetic and potential energy. From part A, we know that the change in the ball's kinetic energy is equal to the negative change in its gravitational potential energy. This is because as the ball travels vertically upwards, its kinetic energy is transformed into its gravitational potential energy. So we know that half mv squared minus half mu squared, which is a change in its kinetic energy, equals minus mg delta h, which is the change in its gravitational potential energy. The ball's mass will cancel on both sides, which leaves us with half v squared minus half u squared equals minus g, the change in height. We also know when the ball reaches the maximum height, its velocity, that is v, becomes zero. So in order to find the initial velocity to reach a maximum height of 50 meters, we'll make v equals zero, so half times by zero squared minus half times by u squared equals to minus 9.8 meters per second squared multiplied by the change in height, which is 50 meters minus zero. We can cancel the negative on both sides, and that gives us half u squared equals 9.8 times by 50. So u equals 31.3 meters per second. This is the minimum velocity required by the ball to travel to a maximum height of 50 meters. Of course, if the velocity is greater than 31.3 meters per second, then the ball will be able to reach a maximum height that's greater or higher than 50 meters. A ball slides down a hill that is 250 meters tall with an initial velocity of 10 meters per second down to the right as shown. So we have a box with mass m and initially it's 250 meters above the ground and it was moving at 10 meters per second horizontally to the right before it starts sliding down. Assuming there's no friction and air resistance, what is the final speed of the box when it reaches the bottom of the hill? 
So we want to find the final speed when the box reaches this position over here. Now, this sort of question can be easily analyzed by considering the changes in energy of this box. As the box is moving down, its gravitational potential energy decreases and its kinetic energy and therefore increases because we have a transformation of gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy. The change in gravitational potential energy is therefore equal to the negative change in the kinetic energy. We have mg delta h equals minus half mv squared minus half mu squared. The mass on both sides of the equation can cancel out and this will give us g times by delta h equals half u squared minus half v squared. So half v squared equals half u squared minus g delta h and v equals the square root of u squared minus 2g delta h. The initial speed is 10 meters per second so we have 10 squared minus 2 times by the gravitational acceleration which is 9.8 and the change in height here is minus 250 meters as the object has descended by a height of 250 meters. It's important to keep in mind that although the box is moving on a slanted surface, the changing height is always the vertical displacement and not the slanted distance traveled by the box. And of course, this is all square rooted to find the final velocity. This gives a final speed of 122 meters per second. An 800 kilogram car travels on a horizontal road with an initial speed of 20 meters. The driver lets the car come to a complete stop without braking over a distance of 160 meters. What is the coefficient of kinetic friction between the tires of the car and the road? So we have a horizontal surface and we have a car that weighs 800 kilograms and it has an initial velocity of 20 meters per second and let's say it's towards the right. Over a distance of 160 meters, let's say this is 160 meters, it comes to a complete stop, which means that the final velocity is 0 meters per second. In this instance, it's quite clear that the car comes to a stop due to the friction between the tires of the car and the ground. During this entire motion of the car, the car's kinetic energy is decreasing. We can calculate its kinetic energy by considering its final kinetic energy, which is half mv squared minus half mu squared. So we half 800 times by zero, which is the final velocity when it comes to a stop, minus half times by 800 times by 20 squared, which is its initial speed. This gives a negative change of 160,000 joules of kinetic energy. Now all of this kinetic energy has been transferred out of the car due to the work done against the car by friction. So this amount is the work done by friction against the motion of the car. Work done by friction is against the motion in this instance because friction always acts in the opposite direction as the velocity of the object. Now that we have the change in kinetic energy, we can use this to find the work done. The work done against the motion is equal to the same value, minus 160,000 joules. And we know the work done is also given by the force that provides the work done multiplied by the displacement times by cosine theta. So minus 160,000 equals to the force of friction, which is the force that does the work against the motion of the car, multiplied by the displacement, which is 160 meters, times by cosine zero degrees. Angle theta here is the angle between the force vector, which is friction, and the displacement of the object, both of which are horizontal. So the, this, so the angle between the two vectors R is zero. So we have the force of friction equals to minus 1000 newtons. We also know that the force of friction is given by the coefficient of friction multiplied by the normal force. Now in this instance, the normal force on the car is upwards and it balances the car's downward weight force because the car travels horizontally and has no acceleration in the vertical axis. So the net force in the vertical axis should be zero. So the force of friction is also given by the coefficient of friction multiplied by the weight force, mg. So the coefficient of friction is equal to minus 1000 newtons divided by the mass of the car, 800 kilos, times by negative 9.8,
which is the gravitational acceleration. This gives a value of 0 0.13. A trolley rolls down a frictionless track with an initial speed of 10 meters per second at point A, which is 20 meters above the ground. So let's say we have a track, and initially we have a trolley. Let's call this point A. And point A is 20 meters above the ground. The initial speed of the trolley at A is 10 meters per second. The trolley then reaches the lowest point at B. So let's say this point here is B, and when the trolley gets to here, it has some sort of velocity, which we don't know what it is at the moment. Then the trolley travels upwards to a different height, and let's call this C. And the speed of the trolley at point C is 8 meters per second. The first question is, what is the speed of the trolley at B? In questions where it involves the change in a mass's vertical displacement, we have to start thinking about gravitational potential energy and how this relates to the object's kinetic energy. As a trolley moves down by 20 meters, its gravitational potential energy should decrease, and therefore its kinetic energy should increase because its potential energy is transformed into its kinetic energy such that its mechanical energy stays constant. So we can say that the change in gravitational potential energy equals to the negative change in its kinetic energy. So mg delta h is equal to negative of half mv squared minus half mu squared. The mass of the trolley cancels on both sides. So we'll just get g delta h equals to minus half v squared plus half u squared. So v squared equals u squared minus 2g delta h, and therefore v equals to the initial velocity of the trolley, which is 10 squared, minus 2 times by 9.8, and the change in height here is minus 20 meters. And this is all square roots to find the value of v. This gives a final speed of 22.2 .2 meters per second at point b. Now the second question is, what is the height of C above the ground? So we want to find this height of the trolley when it reaches point C. Now this can also be done by considering the trolley's gravitational potential energy and its kinetic energy. We can do this by comparing B and C, but we can also do this by comparing points A and C. As you can see, the speed of the trolley at C is slightly slower than that of A which means that the kinetic energy at C is smaller than that of A. So the trolley's kinetic energy has decreased when it gets to point C compared to the beginning. That means its gravitational potential energy at point C should be higher than when it was at point A. Again, this is because kinetic energy is transformed into the trolley's gravitational potential energy in order to keep the mechanical energy constant. So we can say that the trolley's changing kinetic energy is equal to the negative change of its gravitational potential energy. So half mv squared minus half mu squared equals to minus mg delta h. Mass will cancel out on both sides, and we have half 8 squared, where 8 is the final speed of the trolley at point C, minus half 10 squared, where 10 meters per second is the initial speed at point A equals to minus 9.8 meters per second squared and the change in height here is what we want to find. So the change in height equals 1.84 meters. Now here it's very important to be aware that this change in height does not refer to the height of C above the ground. This change in height is actually between C and point A. It's the vertical distance between the two points. Because when we found this change in height, we considered the changes in energy between point A and C, not between point C and the ground. This means that the change in height of 1.84 meters it refers to the fact that point C is 1.84 meters above point A. So we consider the height of point C is 1.84 meters plus 20 meters, which is the height of A above the ground. This gives a value of 21.84 meters above the ground. A 500 kilogram car moves to the right at 30 meters per second 
collides with another 800 km car moving to the left at 20 meters. So that's said you have horizontal ground and we have two cars. The first one weighs 500 kilograms and it's moving to the right at 30 meters per second. And the second car weighs 800 kilograms and it's moving to the left with a speed of 20 meters per second. Now, after the collision, the 500 kilogram car ends up moving to the left at two minutes per second, while the 800 kilogram car comes to a complete stop. How much heat and sound energy are produced during this collision? This is an energy conservation question because we can first identify the kinetic energy of the cars in the beginning. The kinetic energy of the first car is half times by its mass of 500 kilograms times by its speed of 30 meters per second squared. And the kinetic energy of the second car is also half times by its mass of 800 kilograms times by its initial speed of 20 meters per second squared. This gives a total energy of 3.85 times 10 power 5 joules. Now, by the law of conservation of energy, we expect the total energy after the collision to be equal to the same number. Let's look at the kinetic energy after the collision. Let's call this Ke final. This is equal to half times by the mass of the 500 kilogram car, times by 500, times by its new speed, which is 2 meters per second squared. And now, 800 kilogram car. And because the 800 kilogram car comes to a complete stop, its speed is now zero. So this is equal to a thousand joules. As you can see, the final kinetic energy is far smaller than the initial kinetic energy. Where has this huge difference gone? This change in kinetic energy has been transformed into other forms, such as heat and sound, which will be commonly observed when two cars collide with such a big velocity. So the energy in the form of heat and sound should be equal to the difference between the initial kinetic energy and the final energy of the system, which gives a value of 3.84 times 10 power 5 joules. In this example, we have demonstrated that the total energy of the system is always conserved. And in this collision, majority of the kinetic energy of the two cars have been transformed into heat which is thermal energy, and sound, which is acoustic energy.